All right. So I don't think anyone saw something in the chat. So I'm going to move ahead. And as you know, we have uh, you will have a mail address to contact us if you have a question coming later in your once you're working with, with your data or if something comes to your mind. So for now, let's move to the last presentation of this uh, training session. So that will be on energy balances. This was the created by my colleague Taylor Morrison and me, Nicola Trent, and we are working in the annual energy statistics team within the IEA. And our work is simply, to put it simply, to use all of those five annual questionnaires that you've seen described before, so for the fossil fuel, electricity, and renewables, and use them to build an energy balances. So for this presentation, we'll be separating five main topics, so first, define a little bit what is an energy balance is, and then we discuss why it's very important and we can use them. And for the later part, it will be a little bit spending more time on how we do that, how we manipulate the data, and what are the rules that we try to follow doing so. And then we'll be focusing a bit more on the energy balances layout as we do it in the IEA. So that you really know, can understand that sometimes for different, depending on the organization of the country, this is presented differently. And this will also be a big part of the data session that we will have later on. And finally, we finish by a brief overview of the uses that we can have of the energy balances. So for now, let's talk about what are the energy balances. And before that, you start to know the drill. We have a mentee for you. Let me select it. Here, you should know see the mentee with the correct code. So the, it should be 78419154. So 78419154. And the question is, are you aware or are you working maybe directly on the production of your national energy balances for your country? And uh, you can also find the code written in the chat box. And so we already have seven people that are actually were, that knows of, of the country producing national energy balances, which is nice. But I think we have something like yeah, 87 participants. So we might have more people normally within it. Hmm. Oh, they currently developing it. It's interesting. I would be curious if you can say for which country, from which country you are in the chat. I would be curious to know what are uh, which country is currently developing the energy balances. That's one of the uh, that's a part of our of our work here to assist if you are doing so. All right. So now let's move back to the presentation. Uh, there. So now we are back to the PowerPoint. Um, so let's talk a little bit about definition. So what is an energy balance? So let me just move one thing on the here. Thanks. So an organization can present an energy balance in many ways. And you see on the screen right now the way the IEA chose to do. This is based on what is called the International Recommendation for Energy Statistics, or IRES. Um, this uh, IRES is a set of methodology and rules that have been established by the United Nations regarding energy statistics. And this is a way to build a comprehensive framework of, on the scope of energy statistics for, regarding classifications, units, method, and to put it more simply, it enables us to speak the same language when we talk about the energy field. That with those rules, we can speak the same way of power plants in Africa or in Asia. We can speak of, about the same consumptions in Latin America or in Europe. That they are all relatively similar and we can discuss them. And 
just also something to clarify. We are working for the, on the year. We are working on the annual on an annual basis for the energy balances. So this would be the representations of the energy supply and demand within a country, a territory delimited by border within a year. So if we look a little bit more closely at uh, these energy balances now, you can see that this is a matrix. So a matrix with different dimensions that we call products, flows, years. And uh, within this, may, this table, when we only select one year, you can already descend three main components. So you would have on the top of it, the supply uh, the supply part, which would be corresponding to the, the production roughly and the supplying of the country, of the territories you are studying right now of, uh, of the energy commodities. You would have below it the transformation sector where you will focus on how those energy commodities are manipulated, that are they used to generate another form of energy commodities, etc. And the last part will be on what we call the final consumption, which means, which we call it final consumption, because after this usage, there is no way to use this energy anymore. Uh, those products are not, cannot be used for energy purposes once they have been consumed in those sectors, hence the final wording. Uh, the, one of the interests, and we'll be speaking a little bit more about this later in the presentation, is that for all of those products that you see here, coal, hydroenergy, geothermal, biofuel, they are all comparable uh, between each other. All products are comparable, and we see why just a little bit better. And it's because it's in comparable energy. All of those data, all of those data points are in terajoules, in, in this case, so in energy units which means that they are comparable when you cannot compare a gigawatt, uh, gigawatt hour and a ton of coal, you can compare uh, a thousand of terajoules to a hundred of terajoules. We, those are physically closer. And sorry. So as I explained before, this is a way to paint, to display a global picture of the energy situation within a country. And so you can present this as a table, but there's another way that you can present it, that would be as a graph. And in that case, we call that a Sankey diagram, a Sankey chart. So this chart is actually exactly the same information that you have in the table. It's exactly the same, but just presented with this way of representing the flood between production, transformation, consumption. So you can see there the way the energy flows into the country, if I can say. It's a more visual approach to, uh, to this. And we, so all, all of the scientists, all the agencies are available on our website for the country we publish. So you can consult for your own country if you are curious. You can follow this way with this link, uh, iga.org slash senti. So now, why do we produce the, the synergy balances? In, even if we find them beautiful and they are really interesting new tools, why do we produce those? Um, the energy balances gives a general overview of the total energy system, meaning the supply and the consumption. And for many reasons that will be political, technological development, it's important sometimes to have this global overview of uh, the system and understand how it goes. And by presenting the data in all the data in this common energy unit, we can see the total amount of energy that is used in the, uh, in the country and the relative contributions of each fuel, meaning that you can know if your country is exceptionally dependable on especially dependable on one fuel or as a re re relative stability in between suppliers. It also serves at, as the best, the, sorry, it also serves as a basis for the estimates of CO2 emissions from fuel combustion. So we, my colleague Puya will have probably a lot more to, to say about this, but relatively if it is what, we, what is used to then calculate what uh, the, and estimate the amount of CO2 produced 
by burning energy community within a country, to put it really simply in one sentence. Um, furthermore, a country can analyze its dependency on energy import, as I told you, and as well as the energy efficiency, meaning that it can monitor if its policy in terms of energy efficiency, if it managed to produce the same amount of services or to produce more services with the same amount of, ener of energy. And we can also compare countries in between themselves as they, are, uh, as they rely on the same methodology for these data sets, meaning that you can compare a country that produces a policy A on its energy production to a country using the policy B. And this way you can make sure all makes sense. And finally, it allows to have good basis for, the for, uh, for forecasting, for modeling, for projections, and to uh, check the efficiency of already implemented policies, of course. So now that I briefly talked about all of those definitions, let's go a little bit more within the, the engine and see how we, buy, we are calculating those energy balances. So as I told you, roughly speaking, we take all of the uh, data uh, energy statistics that, uh, is pro that are produced, so by my colleagues using the annual questionnaires, or when the country we are working on do not fill those uh, annual questionnaires for us, using annual publications, websites, official data that we, we can find or that they provide sometimes in different formats. We aggregate all those and we create what we call the commodity statistics. So this is a big table that have all of the data from those different AQs and sources, but not in energy units. It's only the, in the uh, natural, if I can say, units of those data. But in once we have these commodity statistics, we can generate the energy balances. So we need to transform those data in kilotons, in gigawatt hour, or in some other units into the units we want for the energy balances. And to do so, we need a specific item that we will see just right now with another mentee. So we can move to the second question uh, in the mentee. So still the same code of 78419154. And the question is, if you want to convert mass, so kilotons of coal, for example, from the energy statistics into a data and energy units for the energy balances, what do you need? Do you need to use the density of the material, its tariffed value, or the carbon content of it? I will leave you a few minutes, the time for me to have a sip of water. All right, I think you might have already seen this presentation or already be aware of all that. <laughs> so yes, indeed, we need the tariffed value to generate, uh, to, to move from the, uh, sorry, let me find again the point now. So to, to, to move from energy statistics to energy units, we indeed need the tariffed value. So good, uh, good job. And typically this, information on the fuel is found on, in unit of energy per mass, kilojoule per kilograms, for example. It can be found sometimes in energy per volumes, but the most useful one is usually using the mass. So let's get a little bit more into the details here. So we have statistics by products, I told you, and we use a multiplication with the calorific value. So we move from kilotons we multiply the value in kilotons by kilojoule per kilograms to get uh, the data in energy units. And so we process to a few format change in the uh, statistics. That would mean, for example, to apply a negative value to the exports when it was positive in the statistics or these kind of things, just to follow specific rules that we want within the tables. And using that, we get the energy balance. And if we do it, just to remind you on the definition of calorific value, but I think you all know it, it's the amount of heat that you obtain from one unit of energy commodity when you, you burn it. 
and it can be uh, it, it represent basically the amount of energy that you extract from the a physical unit of the commodity. And we insist a lot in this presentation on calorie value because they are quite important. And we have an example just here to explain you why it's not negligible to you to, to be careful with them. So calorie value, that let's say here you have an example of a statistics sheet with data in kilotons. And you have here the value uh, of their calorific, uh, their calorific value, their net calorific value. And you do what I have presented you. So you apply the calorific value and you modify the format to get it into an energy balances. And what you can notice in that situation is that you move from the statistical differences, so a, a differences between the supply and the demand of zero in the statistics to, to differences of 200 within the balances. And this comes from issues within the charifique value that uh, do not match exactly what is real, uh, that, are not, are not of, that do not have any, enough quality in them. So that's why when you create your data in physical unit, you really need to pay attention also to the char to charifique content of it, to also qualify the, quant the quality of the fuel, but also to think in advance of when you need to transform those data. You need a, a good charifique value that match depending on the flow that you're studying, the traffic value of the productions, of the importation you have, or of the consumption in specific uh, sectors. So now we have, so, the, so now we have the, the way we transform, we pass from uh, energy statistics to energy balances. So now we need to, we have several steps to follow to keep building our, our balances. So you have, you need to set a common unit for the accounting. You need to choose if you want to work in net or gross charafit value. And to, we be, or again, doing a bit more on the charafit value by products. And then we spend more time on what we call the primary energy problem, which is a little bit more, probably the most difficult part of this presentation. So I will try to spend more time on it. So first of all, what energy to use? You have a lot of energy uh, units that you can use in that. You have British thermal units, ton of oil equivalent, ton of coal equivalent, juice, what hours, a lot of uh, uh, unit energies. In the AA, we chose recently to use joules. For a long time, we were using kilotons of oil equivalent because of many reasons, historically, and for some other political reasons. And now we move to joules, which are more close to scientific approach and use more usable for many of our users, actually. So, Jules, you know, but any of those units are valid because you just need to apply a conversion factor to move from one to the other. Then, net or gross charifique value. To remind you, I think you already discussed it in the gas presentations, you have a difference between net charifique value and gross charifique value for the energy commodities. This comes from the latent heat of vaporization of the water that is produced during combustion, is, that is effectively a lost part of the energy content. So that would be of 5% uh, for coal, 5% for oil, and 10% for gas. In the AEA, we work with the net values, because in our mind, it's the energy that is actually available for the users. But again, it's just a matter of precising it and explaining it in your methodology. And then you just, uh, people can just apply uh, what they need to apply. Now, one last time on the calorific value. So let's say the, the example of coal, natural gas, crude oil, and oil products. Those calorific value for those products, first of all, can vary over time, meaning that, for example, in the case of coal, depending on what strata, strata you are in your, in digging in your mind, the quality of the coal will not be the same. So you need every year to recheck to make sure that the calorific value is still correct. Of course, it varies between commodities. So coal and oil products do not have the same uh, calorific value. But even within coal, between different types of coal, you have sometimes big differences. So you cannot just use a default one for every of those products. From country to country, of course, Natural gas produced in uh, South Africa and natural gas produced in Norway will not have 
the same carbon value. It will not be exactly the same gas with the same amount of carbon in it. And then finally, from flow to flow. Meaning, for example, in the case, the amount of coal that you have imported uh, through trade will not have the same carbon value than the one that is consumed in the residential sector because it's not the same product that is sold at that moment. And sometimes with the transportation, you can also get different uh different different values there so now that we move out of the carefit value uh questions let's go a bit more into one of the difficult parts of the energy balances which is as we saw for the for, for the combustible sources of electricity it's far more easier to report the no not far more easier but it's easier to report the data because you have the production and you just have to report the input to power plant, to electricity plant, or to CHP, and the output in another line uh, or another column for electricity. But for non-combustible combustible sources, such as nuclear, hydro energy, or geothermal, wind, and solar, it is a little bit more tricky, because what is exactly the input to the power plant, and what are the outputs? This needs to have a convention, and there are many ways that this could be done, I will just present here the way the IES follows because of IRES, but they, this can be challenges for through some other methodology. So we use what we call the uh, we follow we, in the monitor what we call the primary energy. So we calculate the amount of primary energy uh, input into those uh, power plants. And how do we define the form of primary energy that we'll be monitoring for the supply part? So we need to we choose in the year to follow up with the first energy form that has multiple energy uses. So to clarify it, for the point of nuclear, it will be the heat. We do not monitor the uranium or radioactive materials because they do not have multiple energy uses. It's only used for those one. Uh, another example, for example, in the case of electricity for hydro. So we only monitor the electricity direct output of the hydro dam because the uh, potential energy of the water behind the dam does not have any other energy uses possible. If this is just for the, uh, the we focus on the first one that could have different way of being, um, of being used. So once we choose what type of primary energy we'll be monitoring, we need then to decide how we report that for the transformation part. So we use what we call the physical energy content method. Basically, we try to monitor the amount of energy from, that is within the primary form of energy and that will be useful, that will be enough to generate the output that we are monitoring. So for to do that, we would have to use some what we call implied efficiencies. So for example, to go again to the example of nuclear, remember nuclear, we use heat as primary form of energy. But most of the time when we receive the data from our contacts, they only report the amount of electricity that is produced from nuclear plants because this is what the plant say is selling. This is what is more easy for them to monitor. So what we do when we if we create our energy balances, but we, we are back calculating, applying an implied efficiency of 33% to the nuclear transformation to have the original primary heat that will be reported as production in the uh, energy balances. Um, for another example, it's the same for solar thermal. We, most of the time, solar thermal plants, we only report the amount of electricity that they are selling. And we will have to monitor to batch calculate then using a uh, 33% efficiency estimation for the uh, electricity uh, generations. And if the plant is, probably, is also selling heat, in that case, we are also taking all of the electricity, of the, of the heat, sorry, as 100% efficiency in that case, because it's not tra a transform heat, it's just conducted. It's more easy, it's more easy for hydro, wind, and solar PV as we are on focusing on the electricity as primary energy form. So we're just applying a 100% efficiency in the transformation. So meaning that's what you have in the production line and what we have in the uh, input to power plant line in the energy balances, 
will be the same. I know this is a little bit uh, complicated, but we we'll go so a little bit more into it during the exercises. So bear with me here. And so here are so again some examples as I described to you. So we have 1,000 terajoule. Uh, we have an energy input of 1,000 terajoule of electricity from a wind plant. And that we have estimate 100% efficiency for in that case. So it's 100% terajoule of wind that is inputted into the, the wind, uh, wind mill. And again, for nuclear and for the other sources, depending on which effic implant efficiency we are using here, you will have different uh, inputs of primary energy equivalents. Of course, if countries report to us the uh, the real efficiency that they have, we try to use them, but most of the time we have to use those implied efficiency. Um, I think we are a little bit late and I would like to keep some time for the uh, exercises and the uh, Q&A, so I will skip this many question. Is someone speaking? Oh, hey. I think someone forgot to mute. Uh, okay, it's, uh, sorry, uh, sorry about that. So let's go quickly to uh, a detail view, more detail view on the energy uh, lay balances layout. So as I told you, you have three main sections. So you would have the production, the supply part on top of it which include, for example, the production, but also the trading, the bunkering, and the stock change. And uh, let's focus here on following the oil products column, because it's a little bit more interesting. Uh, so you see there is no domestic production, and you have a negative supply, uh, TES, for total energy supply, that you have here. Uh, this negative TES indicates that the uh, production, the actual production of those products as they are secondary products and not primary ones will be happening in the transformation sectors. So in that case, you will see, for example, that you have a negative input of crude oil into the, the line or refineries and a positive output of oil products, which represents the transformations within this, uh, this process. And for, to see another case of that, you can look at the coal column. You have a negative input of coal into electricity plants. And further to the right, you have a positive output of electricity from coal within the electricity plant. And if you sum all of that in the total column at the far right of it, you will see that for, in the case of electricity plant, you have a negative figures. This represents the losses of energy that you would have in these transformations. Because as you probably all know, none of the energy transformation that you can do most of the time have a, a high efficiency. Most of the time, for, especially for, 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 for sorry, combustible fuels, electricity generation, you will be low, around 30% or lower in the productions. And so we'll be going back to this a little bit more in the exercise part. And to finish briefly, to have then a time for questions. So we, what are the uses of those energy balances beyond or, or as cool as they are? So applying space, some basic economic indicators like population and GDP of a country, you can already, sorry, produce, product a lot of indicators that can be useful for analysis for political reasons or for, for even classifying and comparing countries in between them. For example, here you can monitor the total energy supply of uh, total energy supply per capita, so per inhabitant of India, and see how this evolves over over time and see, for example, the impact of some of some events, worldwide events in the 2020s and uh, and uh, after that. You can also uh, compare as a total countries in between themselves. So comparing the T, uh, total energy supply and the GDP of the country of different economies and see if the, the economy is energy intensive or not. And you can also monitor the self-sufficiency. So by dividing production over total supply of different pro energy commodities of a country to see how 
dependent they or self sufficient they are on the um, on this lastly uh not exactly, actually, you can also uh from energy balance that told you create and calculate your co2 emissions to put it out very simply you apply uh, car uh, carbon content factors to the uh, energy uh, consumption that you have in your energy balances. This is a bit sum up of the uh, huge work that my colleagues are doing, but just to cite it briefly. And you can also track some of the sustainable development goals uh, that have been established by the UN. And to conclude, uh, before we move to the Q&A, good energy balances, they require a good quality in statistics for physical data and of charity feed value. Again, I implant. They are a compact source of energy information. You can read a lot about a country using their energy balances. And they enable accurate checks of the energy statistics. For example, if you want to check the efficiencies of your transformations in your statistics, or et cetera. And there's a foundation for some of the basic energy indicators, energy accounting, and CO2 emission estimates.